as you are working on your game, your number one job above everything else is making sure that your game is fun. But there's a problem. Fun is subjective. And fun tends to diminish over time. You, the creator, will play and test your game hundreds and hundreds of times, and you will lose objectivity. So if fun is subjective, it's hard to have really concrete goals in terms of how much fun your game actually is. And if we can't be objective, then it's really difficult to measure how fun our game is. So if we can't pinpoint what actually makes a game fun, and we can't measure the level of fun, then how the f do we design a game that's actually fun? So let's start at the beginning to try to define fun, specifically for games. Tim Schafer, the designer behind Psychonauts and Brutal Legend, says that all good games provide wish fulfillment. They should make players feel something that they aren't in the real world. Powerful, smart, sneaky, skillful, successful, rich, bad, heroic. I like this quote, and it rings true for me for a lot of my favorite games when I was younger. Final Fantasy VII and Ocarina of Time made me wish that I could be the characters in those games, or just that I could live in those worlds. But I've also played games that I loved that didn't evoke that response in me at all. So I kept digging, and that's when I came across a framework called the MDA framework, short for Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetics. This framework divides fun into eight different categories. Number one is sensation, meaning players enjoy memorable audio or visuals. Number two is fellowship, where players have to work together to complete an objective. Number three is challenge, where players get to feel a sense of mastery when they overcome those challenges. Number four, fantasy, a player gets to imagine that they are a character in that world. Number five is narrative, there's a really strong story which makes the player want to keep coming back. Six, discovery, where players have fun finding hidden collectibles, items, power-ups, other playable characters, or just new content. 7. Expression, where players are given the freedom to be able to express themselves in the game. Maybe it's through customizable characters or skins, or maybe they can shape the entire world. And number 8 is Submission, where the player can just unwind, relax, and play with very little thought or effort involved. Now this framework was designed specifically with games in mind. So this is 8 different ways that players can have fun while playing video games. And at this point, I feel like it's really important to note. We're talking about fun throughout this video, which sounds all happy and positive. But what about games that evoke negative emotions from players? Should we be trying to avoid those? This video here, which I highly recommend to anyone familiar with the Zelda franchise, will show you how there's an undertone of sadness and sorrow to the Zelda games, where sorrow is almost infecting the world and Link plays the role of healer. That's a strong narrative. Fear is a key ingredient used for fun in almost all good horror games. And I've been playing through the Dark Souls series with my my son, and frustration is definitely something I've been experiencing while playing that game. Same with the first time I played Hollow Knight. I remember, I counted, the first time I encountered Nightmare King Grimm, I died over 60 times. That was frustrating. But as a player, I got to feel a sense of huge accomplishment when I overcame that challenge. And now I find it easy. So you don't need to shy away from negative emotions just because they sound negative. There's often an accompanying sense of happiness, triumph, and relief following those negative emotions, which will make your game memorable. By the way, if you're enjoying the video, then thank you if you leave a like or a comment. So back to our eight categories of fun. Let's come up with a couple of examples. Ocarina of Time. I would say they do a good job using sensation, challenge, fantasy, narrative, and discovery. Celeste. Sensation, challenge, fantasy, narrative, and discovery. Okay, let's go with Hollow Knight. Sensation, challenge, fantasy, narrative, and discovery. <laughs> I think I just figured out why those are some of my favorite games. Okay, let's do one more. Stardew Valley. Sensation. Fellowship, if you play it online. Fantasy, discovery, expression, and submission. All right, we found a different one there. So using this framework can be a really interesting exercise. And I think giving these some thought before creating your design document can be really helpful. But with game dev, there can be a huge discrepancy between what you think might be fun on paper and what actually plays out being fun once you have it working in your engine. You might think that putting an enemy around every single corner to jump scare the player is fun on paper, but in practice, it can just end up being really frustrating. I'm talking to you from software. So in moving from a design on paper, or even just a design that's in your head, to actually executing that and getting it to work in your engine, an inevitable part of that process is iteration. 
testing and tweaking. You're going to have to test and you're going to have to tweak. Now, again, you will lose objectivity to your own game. But if you put your designer hat on and you try to think like a designer, or maybe even better yet, think like a player and play your game with a critical eye, what's fun in your game may or may not stand out to you. If it doesn't, there is one thing that will stand out to you above everything else. And that is things that are not fun. Scott Rogers, the designer of Pac-Man and the author of Level Up, which is a book I highly recommend, by the way, if you want to get into the headspace of a designer. He says, start with a fun idea. And then as you develop your game, as you come across things that are not fun or they're unfun, remove them. And then after you have removed all of the unfun, all that should be left is fun. If your character took damage because of poor camera placement or enemies don't telegraph their attacks well enough or a few sound effects just feel really off or out of place or you consume your Estus flask way too slow, you'll know it and that should be fixed. So what do you do if you can't find the unfun? Maybe you're playtesting your game for the thousandth time and you just can't tell anymore. Or maybe there is nothing that's glaringly bad. You're just playing the same polished level that you've played hundreds of times before. If that's where you're at, then this is where other people are going to help you more than you can help yourself. You need playtesters. And it's obviously ideal if you can get playtesters that are within your target audience. What is the age range for your game? Are you going after casual gamers or hardcore gamers? You do not want your mom to playtest your Souls-like game, unless she's an incredible gamer and can be really objective with her feedback. I would also say that getting feedback from a few other designers is a good idea but not exclusively. I've noticed something interesting with game devs giving advice to other game devs. When a designer gives another designer a game with the intention of critique my game, that other designer is going to really put on their critique hat and they're gonna play it like a designer and not like a player. They're going to specifically be looking for flaws. And this is not a bad thing at all, but it's not 100% objective either. If you were a painter and you wanted to know if people liked your paintings, asking only other painters if they liked your painting is not really the best way to go. Go to the people. Go to other painters for advice about painting, but go to people to see what they like and what they don't like. That's why I say don't exclusively get feedback from just other game devs. So get your feedback and then make changes based on that feedback and then get new feedback to make sure that the changes you made are good ones and then move on to the next thing. And this is really, really important. Be prepared and willing to throw out bad ideas or good ideas if they don't fit with your game. Last tiny, tiny little tip, make stuff breakable. Seriously, look at Enter the Gungeon. You don't even need to shoot things. You just mow down pots and stuff by walking on them. I'm a little biased. I love games that have a lot of breakable items. That's all I got, guys. See you in the next one. Bye.